For thousands of years, humans have pondered the question, are we alone in the universe? It's pretty obvious that even in the modern era, we still have a fascination with the idea of extraterrestrial life. We have an endless amount of movies, shows, books, and other forms of media that have aliens as the main premise of the story. But many times, these stories overlook one of the main issues if we were to ever encounter alien life, which is, how in the world are we going to talk to them in the first place? In this video, we'll be answering this question by looking at our past attempts at communicating with extraterrestrial life. We'll also be looking at the fundamental blocks that make up human language, attempting to find out which of these blocks we share with our cosmic cousins. I mean, assuming that the aliens are friendly and somehow arrive on Earth to be able to talk to us, how would we even begin to understand one another? I mean, even humans can't 100% understand one another due to language barriers present within our own species. Now, a lot of you might be asking, what about that alien movie that has a linguist as the protagonist? Well, yes, the movie Arrival does in fact deal with this exact topic. However, like any other movie, a lot of details are overplayed for the entertainment factor. For example, the movie heavily relies on the Sapir Whorf hypothesis, which states that language influences how we perceive and think about our world. In the film, the aliens have a non-linear language, written in circles, which apparently means that the aliens perceive time non-linearly as well. Meanwhile, humans speak linear language, so our perception of time is linear. By the end of the movie, it is suggested that if humans learn the alien language, then we will also be able to perceive time non-linearly, just like them. However, the Sapir Whorf hypothesis is extremely controversial and not widely accepted by the majority of modern linguists. Disregarding this inaccuracy though, the linguistic process of figuring out an unknown language was pretty accurate as the film had aid from three linguists from McGill University. Now, would we be able to use this same process to figure out an alien language as shown in the movie? Well, there are two caveats to this. One, an alien's biology will likely be very different than that of a human. If language is heavily based upon human cognition, then how would we even begin to talk to an alien species? Two, the method used in the movie relies a lot on back and forth communication. I mean, assuming aliens haven't come to Earth themselves, we would have to be sending messages that would take decades or even centuries to arrive at their destinations. Therefore, we would have to be able to construct a message that is self-interpretable without relying on this back and forth communication. To talk with alien life, we need to figure out what we have in common. Basically, what ideas can we assume to be universal? Literally. To answer this, let's go to the year 1952, where a British zoologist and medical statistician named Lancelot Hogman wrote a book called Science in Authority. One of the chapters in this book is called Astroglossa, which is an attempt to make a cosmic language. In Hogman's explanation for creating Astroglossa, he points out two commonalities that we most likely share with other intelligent life forms. One is that in every linguistic group on Earth, there exists the concept of natural numbers. Although the Piraja language is an exception to this, but that's a can of worms I won't be going into today. And two, we share celestial events, such as the planets in the solar system and the phases of the moon. Keep in mind that at this point in time, no exoplanets had been found, so Hogman created Extraglossa, assuming that there were Martians. Alright, so therefore, Hogman suggested that an interstellar message should be designed to have numbers be the basis on which to build meaning. Then, we could branch out into discussing celestial events. But could we truly base our message just upon numbers? Are numbers universal? I mean, we know that different cultures around the world have various numbering systems. For example, we today use the base 10 system, which is where we have the numbers 0 to 9, then repeat at each 10th interval. However, other cultures like the Mayans had a base 20 system, meaning they had symbols for 0 to 19 and then repeated at every 20th interval. According to Hogman, this should be no problem since all numbering systems share three main features, iteration, rank order, and gap. Iteration means the repetition of symbols to represent larger and larger quantities. For example, in a base 10 system, we repeat the symbols 0 to 9 to get bigger and bigger numbers. Rank order means that the position of these symbols determine their value. So in the number 70, 7 is in the tenths place, making it represent 10 sevens rather than just a 7 and gap means that we have a placeholder symbol to understand the ranking of a number. For example, we need the number 0 for the number 70 to show that it's a value of 10 sevens, because without that 0, it would just be a 7. Because all the numbering systems across the world share these features, one can take any numbering system and convert it to another one. Therefore, an alien species wouldn't have a hard time deciphering it, assuming they also share these fundamental principles as well. So, what's the most basic numbering system that can still carry vast amounts of information? Before we get into that though, I'd like to introduce today's sponsor for the video. 
italki. Italki is an online language learning platform that I personally use quite often since I live in an area that doesn't really have many Japanese speakers. Italki was great for this as I was able to select a private tutor for personalized one-on-one -on -one lessons to fit my busy schedule during university. Also, I was able to practice my Japanese with native speaking teachers of the language, which was how I was able to improve my speaking. You're also able to get real-time feedback and guidance from language experts who can cater to your language needs. Now this isn't just for Japanese, of course. There are over 30,000 teachers worldwide, so you'll be sure to find a tutor that can fit your own busy schedule. The best thing about italki is that there's no subscription. You pay per lesson, which allows for so much flexibility at an affordable price. Here's a short clip from one of my lessons. So, <laughs> if you're interested in maximizing your language output no matter where you are, click the link in the description below. The first 50 people who use the promo code LINGOTTER5 get a free $5 with the purchase of $10. Thank you italki for sponsoring this video and let's go back to outer space. As some of you may know, all our technology runs on a massive sequence of zeros and ones. These zeros and ones are actually a type of numbering system, a base two numbering system called binary, which we can use to communicate with our alien friends. For this video, you don't need to know the ins and outs of how the binary system works, but the important thing is that we understand that just by using zeros and ones, we're able to send and receive a vast array of information. For example, Whenever you text someone, you're just sending a series of zeros and ones which are then translated into valuable information that can be read by the other person. Heck, even this video is just a bunch of zeros and ones put into the right order. So, we should probably be using the binary system to communicate with aliens. Thankfully, we have already done just that. It was on November 16, 1974, on the island of Puerto Rico when humanity sent their first message into the stars with the intent of having it be received by extraterrestrial life. The message was sent using the Arecibo radio telescope. However, although efforts were made to make a message that could be understood by alien life, the message was done more as a celebration of Arecibo's technological capabilities. There's almost no chance the message will ever be seen. Despite that, we can learn a lot from this message, so let's pretend we're aliens attempting to decode the signal. So, the message was sent at a frequency of 2380 megahertz. This frequency would represent the zeros. To represent the ones, they increase the frequency by 10 megahertz to get 2390 megahertz. So they would switch between these two frequencies to send their series of zeros and ones. In total, the message sent 1679 bits a bit being a zero or one, so we have a sequence of 1,679 zeros and ones. Now, what do we do about all these zeros and ones? Well, maybe there's a reason these humans sent exactly 1,679 bits. We think it over and over again until we realize that 1,679 has a special property. It's a semi-prime number, being only divisible by 1, 23, 73, and 1,679. The 1 and the 1,679 are probably unimportant, so let's discard that. But now we have the numbers 73 and 23. What do we do about those? So let's think about it more and more until we come to the conclusion that this must be the humans telling us how to organize these 1,679 bits into a 2D array. But should we organize them in a 23 by 73 array or a 73 by 23 array? Uh, let's try plotting both and seeing what looks better. As you can see, it's still a bit hard to see what's going on here. Maybe this is meant to be an image, so let's convert the zeros into white squares and ones into black squares. As you can see, the left image is a mess of randomness, while the right one does look like an intentional image or a message. So let's use that one. By the way, I'm just going to make this image colorful just to make it easier to interpret, but in reality, they would be black and white. Each color is a different portion of the message, so let's take a look at it one step at a time, from top to bottom. Remember how we talked about numbers being the first part of the message? Well, here we are essentially teaching the aliens how to convert the binary base 2 numbering system into the base 10 numbering system that we use. These bottom white tiles are just to show when a new number starts so we don't have to pay much attention to it. On the leftmost column from top to bottom, we have black, black, white. Then the extra white tile on the bottom to show it's the start of a number. So black, black, white actually corresponds to 001, which if converted from binary is the number one. Now we do the same process for the first seven numbers, but for the numbers eight through 10, it's a bit different since the number seven is the highest you can go with only three bits. So eight to 10, 
then add another column so we can get 0010000 for the number 8. Now that we've taught these aliens how to count using our base 10 numbering system, let's go on to the next section which is this purple area. Using the same strategy as before, we can see that these purple tiles, when turned into binary, actually represent the numbers 1, 6, 7, 8, and 15 from left to right. As an alien, we might wonder what these numbers mean, but we can pretty safely assume that whoever is contacting us understands the elements that make up the universe. So which elements correspond to these numbers? Well, the thing that distinguishes each element in the universe is the number of protons they have. So the elements that have 1, 6, 7, 8, and 15 protons are hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus. These are actually the elements that make up the human DNA. Now, the alien civilization knows that humans use a base 10 numbering system and that these numbers can represent the elements of the universe. By now you've probably noticed that we're slowly building upon each previous step. So now that we know about the elements, the next logical step would be to combine these elements to make molecules, which is exactly what we see here in the green part of the message. Each of these little drawings from left to right correspond to the previous order of elements we decoded in the purple section. So in this first little green drawing, we have 7 hydrogen, 5 carbon, 0 nitrogen, 1 oxygen and zero phosphorus, which corresponds to the molecule called deoxyribose, which is a part of the human DNA. Now, if we do the exact same thing to each green drawing, we get the molecules if you've taken a biology course, you may know that these chemicals are the ones that make up the structure of the DNA. All right, let's go to the next section. Thankfully, things get a little easier now that we know how to decode. For the blue section, it's simply just a 2D representation of a double helix, which is the structure of our DNA. That stick in the middle is binary for the number 4.3 billion, which was believed to be the amount of nucleotide base pairs in the human genome. We now know that this isn't the case, we actually just have 3.2 billion nucleotide base pairs, but you live and learn. Now here we see red tiles, which just represent the image of a human. And the white tiles on the left are binary for the number 14. Hopefully, they get the hint and multiply 14 by 126 millimeters to get 1,764 millimeters, which is the height of the average US male. Now, the white tiles on the right of the human is just a binary number equaling 4.3 billion, which was the human population in the year 1974. Okay, now let's go on to the next part of the message. It's just a visual representation of our solar system, with Earth being slightly closer to the human to show that we're from that planet. The next section is also just a picture. This time, it's a drawing of the Arecibo radio telescope. The white tiles below are binary once again, showing the number 2430, which when multiplied by the 126 millimeter wavelength gets you 306.18 meters, which is the diameter of the radio telescope. All right, so now you know how to decode a hypothetical message to extraterrestrial life. As I said, there's almost a zero chance that an alien civilization will receive this message. Even if they received it, we aren't confident that they'll be able to decode this message. So what if instead of sending a radio signal, why don't we send out something physical? Something that they're able to get much more information out of? Well, three years after this Arecibo message, we did just that. Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 were probes sent to do flybys of Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, and Pluto. After completing these missions, the probes would leave the solar system, never to be seen again. Scientists took advantage of this opportunity and decided to construct a message that could be read by extraterrestrial civilizations. The leader of this project was Carl Sagan, who was a scientist who also took part in creating the Arecibo message we decoded earlier. Now that we could attach a message to something physical, we had the opportunity to store much more information. In this case, they decided to use a phonographic record, basically just a vinyl. The way that phonographic records work is is that the sound waves are converted into electrical energy, which is then converted into mechanical energy, which etches the information onto the record. To listen to the record, it's just the process reversed. An advanced civilization is able to convert one energy to another, so we can assume aliens are able to do this as well. But how would they know that the disc isn't just a disc? Well, they would probably see the depths of the grooves on the record and see that they look like waveforms. However, even if they are able to extract this information, they'll probably 
probably have a hard time understanding anything from it. The part of the record with human speech is just a bunch of greetings in various languages. It would have been more useful to just have a diverse conversational language be spoken so that there's enough linguistical data to decode. Another part of the message is very similar to the Arecibo message, where it starts with binary numbers and slowly builds up to more scientific concepts. Despite their attempts, Carl Sagan later admitted that this message was made more for us humans rather than it being a serious attempt at communicating with interstellar life. After the Voyager 1 and 2, many were inspired to send even more probes out into the universe. However, the vast amounts of possible destinations in the universe mixed with the time and energy required to send out a probe made it quite impracticable. For that reason, we decided to just go back to sending radio signals, despite the limitations. By this point, we have established a sort of standard for creating messages for extraterrestrial life. As Hogman said while making the Astroglossa language, the two fundamental things that we share with aliens would be numbers and celestial events. However, over time, we refine these thoughts even more. Instead of thinking of sharing numbers with aliens, we say we share mathematics with them. Instead of saying we share celestial events, we share the laws of the universe. So now we construct our cosmic language with the most simple numbering system, binary. Then we use this system to explain atoms, then elements, then molecules, then gravity and so on. From there, we can finally begin to abstract little by little until we're able to simply speak our human language, since by this point, the alien civilization would have the necessary components to decode our language. With this in mind, we arrive to the year 1999. A Texas-based company sent a message out into space using the Evpatoria radar located in Ukraine. There were two sections of this message. The first section contained four scientific messages, each with their unique ways of attempting to establish understanding with extra extraterrestrial life. The second section included short messages by the individuals who crowdfunded the project. Among the four scientific messages, one of these was the Arecibo message that we mentioned earlier and decoded earlier. Another was one made by the Canadian scientists named Stephanie Dumas and Ivan Dutel. We'll be focusing on this part specifically. In Dumas and Dutel's message, they included 23 pages of information, each page being a 127 by 127 2D array. Each unique symbol on this page is exactly 5 by 7 pixels. Keeping this consistent helps the receiver of the message when one symbol starts and where one ends. Let let me quickly explain how this works by looking at this equation here. The left side has four dots, which means exactly what you think, the number four. Then this middle part is binary for the number four, zero, one, zero, zero. So the symbol between the left and the middle ones must be the equal sign. We see that same symbol for equal on the right side of the binary number, which tells us that this symbol also means four. So the equation is basically just four equals four equals four, just showing the various different ways of representing the same thing. So this is part of the the first page, but each of the 23 pages is dedicated to their own topics, slowly building on top of one another. I'll quickly list out the order of topics so you can see for yourself. First, we start with arithmetic equations as we just saw before, exponents, variables, geometry, elements, mass, hydrogen atoms, units of measurement, temperature, the solar system, the earth and moon, days, years and orbits, earth's crust, atmosphere, water and gravity, human appearance, human physiology, DNA, cells, map of earth, left projection, map of earth, right projection, F radar parameters, cosmology, and finally the last page contains questions for the alien civilization to answer. As you can see, scientific concepts build on top of one another. However, you may be noticing that we didn't include one crucial part of being human, our language. Human language feels like something that would be impossible to break down into something logical, like mathematics. But think again, we are able to break down human language into mathematics using something called lambda calculus. But that's a whole nother can of worms for a different video. It would take too much explaining and this video is already getting a bit long. So hopefully now you know the past attempts at contacting alien civilizations, as well as how to construct a message to make it intelligible. Now we put a lot of emphasis on mathematics and the laws of physics being a basis for this message, but there's a possibility that an alien civilization thinks about these concepts vastly differently than we do, so it would just make these messages pointless. Like what if the aliens think in irrational numbers rather than rational ones? Or what if the way they describe the universe is so different than our physics? These are possibilities of course 
course, but at that point, it would just be basically impossible to establish communication with aliens. All we can hope for is that the alien civilization that receives our message has similar thought processes as us. Anyways, I'd love to hear your thoughts about how we could communicate with extraterrestrial life. If you like language content like this, remember to hit that subscribe button down below. Finally, I'd like to thank my Patreon supporters who are a big reason these videos are able to be made. Shout out to Derek Moore, Dylan Westbrook, Warren Actual, Zergon, Manrock1, and Michael McNay for being Patreon supporters. See y'all next time. Ciao!